Well, hey there. In this video, I will show you two different ways on how to create a pen and ink portrait drawing. And I'll show you two different methods and two different outcomes. Number one, I'll use a traditional dipping pen with a classical approach. And in number two, I'll be using just a big pen and show you a non-traditional way of creating a portrait drawing. So you're well prepared for the incoming Inktober season, if that's what you choose to participate in. My name is Carolyn Peters and I'm the owner of Kira Studios where I teach classical drawing to lab artists who need a refresher of the fundamentals so they can reconnect to their creative voice. If that sounds like you, please stick around, get on my email list and like that we can stay connected and you get all the videos directly into your inbox. Okay, so here you have my underdrawing for the first version where I'm uh, using an HB graphite pencil. It's easy to erase. It doesn't smudge too badly. And I'm working on a smooth surfaced bristle paper made by Canson. I really like the surface and I will be working with a dipping pen. The nib is made by a zebra. This is a G nib and I am dipping into a walnut ink. So I like to have a little testing area where I test out what the flow of the ink is like, what my marks will look like, just making sure that it's working the way I want it to work before I actually make my first marks on the ink drawing. And for this first one, I wanna make a more controlled sketch. And then the second one, I'll show you a more loose sketch. What I love about the G nib is that it is very flexible in the kind of a line that it creates. So I can go from thin, broken, to really nice and thick, to thin, all in one mark. And I love that versatility. I also enjoy that sometimes you scratch a little bit in the wrong way and something accidental happens. And I personally enjoy playing with these accidents as they give some more life to the drawing so it doesn't look so generic and like it's made from a computer. So you saw me begin with contours, outer contour here of the face, outer contour of the hair, but I'm also placing marks where there are major plane changes. So here where her hair is fading from one color to the next, I place marks right there. I'm also placing marks right here to outline that this is a plane change from the forehead to the side of the head. And I'm trying to go for outer edges and major plane changes first before I address smaller details and more subtle plane changes. And the beauty of having prepared your underdrawing is that when I am in the inking phase, I can make small adjustments. I have something to correct but I also don't have to worry about, oh, what happens if I make a mark that isn't quite right? Because I've already ensured that it's pretty good already. I wouldn't allow myself to ink the drawing unless I felt pretty good about the current state of proportions and so on. So here, plain change from the front of the ball of the nose to the sides of the ball of the nose, side of the wing of the nose. As a side note, I'm working on an incline, which is not ideal for pen and ink drawings. That's just how my workstation is set up. But I recommend that you work on a flat surface because then the ink flow of the ink running down the nib is much better. So make sure you're setting yourself up for success. I'm just gonna struggle with what I have set up here. When I do one side of a feature pair, like the eyes, I immediately go over to the other side rather than working now down the lips. I'm going back over to the other side, making sure that they match up, that they're aligned. So see here, this is a fairly rounded plane change, kind of from the front of the underbrow to the side temporal area. So I'm giving that these kind of cross contour marks to turn the form here. I did the same thing up here. So I wouldn't draw a straight line here like I do for the outer contours. So the lower lip has a more gradual plane change. 
to the side of the face. So I'm not putting a harsh line there. I'm using these hatch marks to leave a more open line there. The upper lip is a more distinct plane change. So I'm leaving an actual line there, an actual contour. So now you can see that I still have the underlying graphite lines here. I'm gonna leave them because I wanna make sure that this has had a good chance to dry because if I erase this now with my kneaded eraser, I'll probably smear all this stuff. It has happened plenty of times, so let's not repeat my mistake over and over again. So now I have all my edges in, right? Outer edges as well as these inner plane change edges. So now my next phase is adding in value. And if you don't know how to go about adding in value, watch this video that I'm blending in on the top right now and it will explain the different thoughts that I consider as I build value. So now of course when I build my value with pen and ink I can't shade in terms of making a smooth smudge like tone. I have to build my tone with little lines and there's so many different ways you can create tone, you can cross hatch, you can hatch all one directionally, you can scribble hatch, which I'll probably show you in the second version and set yourself a intention on how you're going to shade your ink sketch before you start and do your best to adhere to that just so you can intentionally produce two different outcomes rather than having to decide in the middle and then mixing up your your cross hatching with scribble hatching and you just want to feel like you're in control by deciding that beforehand. See when I space my lines really close together I get a darker value. If I space my lines further away I don't get so dark of a value and of course I can also vary my lines by just touching down softer and see how they become thinner here they're thicker when I press harder. So there's so much variation we can build with traditional nibs that I just love. Now another thing about pen and ink, it's a little bit similar to watercolors where if you want to have little areas that are staying completely white, then you want to reserve those and kind of make a little note to yourself that you're not going to hatch over them. So think ahead as you go through your work. So here's what I would consider a finished, more controlled style pen and ink drawing using a dipping nib. And again, the medium that I use or the ink that I use is called Walnut Darkening Medium and I really enjoy the way that looks. You can still see the graphite bits sticking out so as I said earlier I'm gonna wait a little while to erase that so I don't smudge anything on accident. So let's take a look now at the second way that you can create a portrait pen and ink sketch with a different approach. Okay, so with this piece, I'm choosing a different tool, <laughs> just some gifted ballpoint pen that I have laying around, just regular, but I wanna use it in a much more loose, uncontrolled way. The principles that I'll be using to establish the drawing will be the same that I used in the dipping pen and ink one, but the look will be different. So I'm allowing my hand to be uh, less controlled and make more squiggly marks. And so you'll see how that has a different effect and I'm doing this to invite you to explore your different pen and ink tools and, and allowing yourself different ways of making marks and then deciding once you have explored different methods which one is actually best for you rather than going outward to other people and trying to copy their styles check out what happens in the privacy of your own sketchbook when you play around with pen and ink and find your own answer find what delights you instead of thinking there's only one way that's best. As you can see, I'm giving myself some training wheels, having this underdrawing makes sure that I don't go completely off the rails with my livelier marks. And of course, when you do allow your hand freedom, it might just mess up. And sometimes you can bring back the messed up drawing from failing completely. And other times it just, you know, keeps going downhill. And no matter how much you struggle and try and put your best efforts in, it just doesn't come back. And that's fine. I don't want you to feel like you failed if your final product ended up less 
than what you're hoping for. You already won because you drew. You already won because you noticed something that works and you noticed something that doesn't work. So the result is not as important as the lessons that you learn along the way. Art is a practice, that's my motto, and I invite you to adopt it for yourself as well. It makes for a much more enjoyable creative path. By the way, both of these models are just wonderful to work with and I highly recommend you find them on Instagram. I'm blending in their handles so you can look them up and support them. I know that Alish, who I'm drawing right now, he has model packs available and they're just absolutely gorgeous. So check him out and check out Emma as well and support them in whichever way you can. They're just fantastic models. So as you might notice, the marks I'm making, they're not as linear. They're very scribbly, rounded, searching. I like to refer them as searching marks. It's not that I'm unsure of what I'm doing. It might look that way, but I'm actually using this kind of scribbly, searching way of making marks uh, to build tone and to define edges. So it's just it just gives me a different result. So if I want a more activated result, if I produce marks like this, this very controlled hatching style, this is not gonna give me a lively look. So choose wisely how you are applying your marks. Now, of course, you're still paying attention to the things I outlined in the video that I mentioned earlier. You're still thinking about, okay, where are my shadow shapes? What kind of edges do they have? Where's the local value darker? How can I build form by modeling the facets within the light mass? I'm just answering those concerns with a different type of mark. And if we were dealing with charcoal, we would probably smudge more and blend more. But we're solving these concerns in ink today. Now here's another thing I will say. When you allow yourself to play around with the way you make marks, you will come across a way of making marks that's particular to you. Especially if you had some training, you might have adopted a teacher's way of building shadows, of shading midtones, and that's fine. But I think we want to get to a place where we recognize our own signature in our work. And we can't do that unless we play around, unless we experiment. And so by giving your hand some freedom, you might realize certain marks as your own, something that creates an effect that you really like that nobody else has. I used to be very controlled in the way I drew. If you look at this picture over here, very traditional. And I still love that way of working. And I think it's valuable to first build the skills so you can do this kind of work. But at a certain point, we want to move on and explore a little deeper about what is possible with our marks and with our tools. Now another important element that you want to consider is that when you do allow your hand a lot of freedom, a lot of scribbly qualities, you must balance that with moments of care and precision. Because if it's all chaotic everywhere and you don't hit the mark in any place, it'll just look like chaotic, ill done drawing. So you want to make sure, and that's why having the underdrawing might be a good idea if you're not that skilled yet. But you need to have corners where your edges are clear and where your shapes are precise, regardless of the fact that you used scribbly marks. And then those areas that are more loose will sing and it won't feel like this is an unskilled piece. So this way of working takes a lot of courage because we risk failing, we risk falling on our face, we risk looking like somebody who doesn't know what the hell they're doing. And I commend you for trying out this way of working loosely, risking something in order to find your own way of making marks in this beautiful, fun medium. Because if we control the results, we always make our form shadows a certain way, if we always produce our midtones a certain way, we always come out with the same results. And if you are interested in producing a product that's to be consumed by somebody else, there's an expectation for how it's supposed to look, then that might be just fine for you. But if your true wish 
is to tap into your creative voice and what it means for you to be an artist and what it means for you to be the kind of person who draws people. Letting your hand go wild and finding the interplay between when you choose to make careful marks and when you choose to make more chaotic marks, that concoction will be truly your own, inimitable. And by doing so, you found something priceless in my opinion. So that's it, now you have two really cool ways of producing portraits in pen and ink and I really want to see what you're up to. If you post a portrait using one of these two methods on Instagram, tag me at Kira Studios. I'd love to give you a virtual high five and see what you're up to. Also, if you want to dive deeper into using pen and ink, I invite you to become a Kira Studios insider. When you sign up to my email list, you get this really awesome welcome freebie. It is a tool guide that explains all the different pen and ink tools that you can choose from and what they're really good at. So become an insider. I'd love to see you on my weekly emails. And of course, I also hope to see you next week for the next video.